Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to episode 48 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome back to the show. In this episode, we are going to be talking reloading. It's a constant subject at the shooting school. It's also a subject that we spend a lot of time talking about on emails, on phone calls, uh, when you get into long range shooting. The next big step, at least in a lot of customers' minds, is getting into reloading. We are also going to be giving away an MDT chassis. It is here. Uh, We want to thank MDT for sending us a chassis. We actually bought a chassis out of our own pocket uh, to give it away here uh, on the podcast and uh, throw a little Facebook thing out there. And MDT reached out to us and said, hey, um, where did you get the chassis? And I said, oh, we just bought it. And they said, hey, uh, we'd like to send that to you. So thank you, MDT, for donating the chassis that we are going to be giving away. We really appreciate it. So without further ado, let's get into some reloading and a rifle chassis giveaway. All right, so I was trying to think about how I wanted to approach this subject because uh, it's one of those subjects that can be simple It can be complicated. You can dive off the deep end and never come back out type thinking and research and development. It is also one of those things that you can put yourself and all of those people around you in harm's way. And making mistakes and reloading and playing with reloading uh, can, can severely hurt you. And so I was trying to think of a way that I could approach the subject try to talk about reloading and and in this episode this is going to be episode one of the series we're going to do two parts of the series but and this one's going to be a a sort of an introductory and food for thought things you should be thinking about whether or not you should get into it some things and food for thought when making the decision processes of the different equipment that you're going to choose and how you're going to set up and go through the learning process because it's a learning process. But I wanted to be careful that I just didn't throw out a bunch of opinions and say, here's what I do and here's what I think you should do because that I think that would be the wrong approach. At the shooting school, we will talk a little bit about what I personally do and what I find success in. Um, but this isn't about me. It's about you trying to get into reloading and doing it as safely, economically, and learning the art of it than it is about what my opinions are of doing it. So when you get into reloading, the first thing I want to throw out there is this. the One of the first subjects that we get into is where do you learn it? And I want to throw out there that there are some NRA courses that actually teach reloading. And so you can go and spend time with somebody, you know, hopefully of, of some decent knowledge that can that can sort of tutor you and go through the process. You can also find somebody that that shoots maybe in some of the disciplines that you shoot in that maybe would take you under their wing and say, hey, how can I do this? And, and they can take you in and show you a step-by-step process. There are tons of videos out there, uh, both free online as well as from manufacturers. And then there are a lot of great books that you can purchase and read. And the one thing that when you approach this subject and subject matter is, is when you're learning from a person, you could be learning both good or bad habits, just food for thought, of what that person does, does well, or potentially does carelessly. And so I always throw out there that when you introduce the human aspect of it or personal opinions or practices, is you can wind up inadvertently falling for something that might actually be unsafe or put you in harm's way. And you're believing the person that's teaching you this as, well, this is how he does it, so it must be right. And so follow up with multiple resources. Go through lots of different classes. Hang out with different people and different personalities. And then, of course, I think beyond that is just verify through multiple resources what is good or what is bad or other people's different opinions on the subject matter. 
uh, just to make sure that you don't get caught in that trap of following one person and realizing that that's the person that's going to blow themselves up on the firing line and maybe too late. When you're considering getting into reloading, one of the things to think about is the time. This is why a lot of guys will shoot factory ammunition, even though they're certainly smart enough and have the resources to buy, you know, whatever reloading equipment they need or what they need to do to take on training wise. But to them, it's a time thing. And taking two or three hours of your time to reload during the week can be really, really hard. Our lives have kept us really busy. Our careers take up a huge portion of our lives. And and the sad part is our families get what's left over. And that's what, you know, every business owner struggles with or a young engineer working all kinds of overtime trying to work his way up. You know, all these things you have to take into consideration. And so is it necessary? Well, you know, we switched over to factory ammunition about two years ago for this very same reason. Number one, is I hand-loaded all the ammunition for the school for for probably more than a decade. And my wife helped, uh, which was awesome. Uh, We'd be down there, you know, just reloading away, making thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition, you know, great quality family time. Uh, Even my daughter would kick in sometimes at a young age and come down and give a hand, which was always uh, fun. But we decided a couple years ago to move away and use factory ammunition And I have to say that for us personally, it was a great choice for the school because this last class was a great example of, A, just how good the ammunition is in certain calibers. Also, the standard deviation and quality of the ammunition that we're getting is getting better by the year. It's amazing. Like we had 6.5 Creedmoor ammunition on the line and we chronographed one of the school rifles and the four speeds that came across the chronograph was 2741, 2743, 2743, 2741. Now, was it a fluke? Maybe, but all of the other rifles that were using the 6.5 Creedmoor ammo chronographed pretty close. I mean, they weren't that close, but they were really close. And I was stunned. I mean, that's a standard deviation of almost two. That is hand load territory. And at a reasonable price. You know, so it's not $100 to $110 a box. So the first thing you need to take into consideration is number one is do you have the time to do it right? And then the resources uh, to purchase the equipment because the cost savings not going to come for a while. Uh, you are you are going to shoot more because you're going to go out and work up loads and you're going to spend time at the range doing this, which is a great side benefit of reloading. It is going to force you to spend more time with your rifle and at the range. But you have to decide if you have the time to do it right. And I think that's the first place to start. If you don't have the time, think about what caliber you want to shoot. Because some calibers pigeonhole you to force you to reload. So if you go out and build your custom rifle, for example, in Six Dasher, which is a great caliber, you have to reload. And not just reload, it's advanced hand loading. I mean, you're... You're fire forming, brass, there's all these other steps that you're going to have to learn how to do as a new reloader that guys that have been reloading their whole lives don't know how to do. So if you're not convinced that you have the time or the money to invest in it, because like I said, besides the time, there is a a cost savings to it, but it comes after a year or two of doing it. Your initial investment can be thousands of dollars in in presses and dyes and and lubricants and, and tumblers for cleaning your brass and all the tools that are going to get involved you're not going to see a savings until you use this stuff for a while and so that becomes part of it as well and then the third thing is is just know your personality be cautious if you're one of those people that really has struggled to be very attentive or focused on attention or I guess maybe the better way to put it is able to really highly concentrate on attention to detail and stay focused because this is hours. It's not 10 minutes of reloading and then off to to watch the, the latest, greatest TV show. This could be hours of making ammunition and mistakes can happen. And if you're not 
really a, attention oriented that that you can hyper focus and ignore the phone when it rings. Don't talk on your cell phone while you're reloading. I never put the TV on. Yeah, I don't have a TV in my my shop to to watch or while I'm reloading. I mean, any distractions like that, you're making ammunition, explosives. So here, you know, know yourself well enough to say, yeah, I can do this and I can do it safely and I can focus for that length of time needed to complete the job. If you can't, then I think that's another thing to take into consideration. Because to get better than factory ammunition, you have to do every step right. And for example, if you load 200 rounds and there's a 10-minute error in there where you fell asleep at the wheel and your charges went all over the place or um, you didn't have enough lube to size the brass properly or you weren't bottoming out the press or some pieces made made it through to the loading process that weren't even full length sized ammunition that doesn't have powder in it really big red flag those are called squid loads or partial loads which is even just as dangerous if not more so you've got 200 pieces of ammunition 180 of them are awesome. I mean, top shelf. But mixed in that lot are 20 rounds that are going to cause you a lot of problems. And so you're going to shoot 10, 15, 20 rounds, and all of a sudden you're going to get a crazy flyer or a squid load. You're going to shoot 10, 15, 20 more rounds, and something else goofy is going to happen. And that's because it's not one of those things where I can pick out the good ones and bad ones. They're all mixed together. And so if you start messing up partway through – or you fall asleep at the wheel, it's all mixed together. You don't know when they're coming out and when they're getting put in the gun. And so you're going to be constantly dealing with aggravation and potentially dangerous situations. So we get through all that and you say, okay, I've got the time not just to do it, but but the patience and time to learn it. I'm going to look for some resources and I'm going to go ahead and invest in getting some equipment. And that's where we're sort of starting this uh, podcast is you know getting the new reloader set up and some things to think about when they're getting started. Be really careful when you get into reloading, and I'm trying to really be careful that I'm not giving opinions and I'm just offering advice and pointing out some things that I've seen people go through over the years and the learning curve that, that you're going to go through when you're when you're starting down this path. There are lots of different jobs that you're going to learn how to do in reloading. For example, your your lubing cases, your cleaning cases, your seating primers, your weighing charges, your your dumping charges, your seating bullets, crimp or no crimp, your you know neck tension issues. You have getting the lube back off the case, you've got primer seating depth, you've got all the tools to adjust in the process. This is a lot to think about. The reason I bring this up here is when you decide to get into hand loading or you're going to venture down this path, be really careful and think long and hard about what you're trying to do and accomplish. You are trying to learn how to make great quality ammunition. And here's where learning each part separately becomes something to think about. There are some great automated presses out there. We're talking to some now about bringing some things in, not, not just to make 6.5 Creedmoor into 22 Creedmoor brass, but to make ammunition for ourselves again. I spoke with one of the gentlemen that's in charge of the whole program yesterday. And we were talking. I'm, I'm hoping to bring him on to the podcast and do an interview with him. But he had sent me an email and said that, hey, I'm heading out. We have a customer that's close by that's having some problems. And uh, me and an engineer are going to go over. And for me, that threw a red flag in the air like, OK, now you've got some explaining to do because we're getting ready to spend a lot of hard-earned money on this equipment. Why are you and an engineer heading over to somebody that has multiple of these presses that's having trouble? I mean, what kind of trouble are they having? So he was very nice later that evening, and he sent me an email back. His comment was he just didn't know how to reload. He didn't understand each of the single processes and jumped right in to try to manufacture ammunition 
with multiple things going at the same time and not really understanding what each individual process is meant to do, how to do it, and things to pay attention to. And so when you're picking out and getting set up for reloading, think long and hard about what you're trying to accomplish and and decide whether or not a single stage press with as little of, of electronics and other gadgets and gadgets involved might be a great choice where something along the lines of a progressive press where multiple things are being done at the same time, although being sold as getting things done faster, the point is to get things done better. And as a new reloader, the more things you're trying to do at the same time, the more chances of introducing error and having all kinds of problems. We see this with custom ammunition manufacturers even making squid loads for crying out loud. I mean that's like a, a not throwing any names out there. But I spent some time with, with some people in different industries and the one person that we had got to know with was really complaining to me about a squid load that, that a customer had accused him of in a handgun. And now the customer wanted this company to pay for their pistol. And this guy was just adamant. We don't have squid loads. I mean he was just really you know just bashing the daylights. Obviously it was on his mind and I just listened Last year, we had some of his rifle ammunition come through our school, and in a bolt gun, there was a squid load. It can happen, but it shouldn't happen at that level. That company should be squared away enough to not be manufacturing ammunition with squid loads. There should be checks and balances in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. That is a newbie error and a dangerous one at that. So when you're thinking about getting set up for reloading, think long and hard about the equipment that you want to buy. I was trying to think of a way that I could say this uh, to maybe get it across over the radio or through the podcast. That would that would sort of make sense. I've been a musician for quite a long time, pretty much most of my uh, young adult and adult life. I love playing guitar. I, I love singing. Um, I love writing. Of course, all that's taken a backseat for the past seven years or eight years with what we do. But but I thought this was a really great way to explain what you're going to have to go through to get this right. And the difference between progressive presses and single stage presses. If you're going to be a guitar player in a band, you have to learn the part. It's a lot of work. If you're going to be a singer in a band, you have to learn the lyrics. You have to be able to sing. You have to learn to sing. You have to be able to hear the song. You have to be able to keep a tune. And you've got to practice. It's a lot of hard work. But if you're going to be the lead singer in a band and playing guitar all night long, to do that is three times as hard. First, you have to learn to play the song. Then you have to learn to sing the song, and then you have to be able to do both at the same time flawlessly without your mind wondering what the next lyric is going to be or what the next chord is going to be. Because if you're playing live and your mind goes, "Uh uh-oh, what's that next chord? Guess what happened to your lyrics? Or you're singing. You, You missed a verse. You, you screwed up the song or you panic about what the next, next line is and, and you mess up your guitar. There is a dance that happened that you have to be able to run right down the middle of the road and do both flawlessly at the same time. That is really hard to do. Hence, you don't see a lot of lead singers out there playing guitar all night long. The same thing happens with reloading except for You are the entire band. You're playing every instrument at the same time together. So be really careful when you get into loading to think about this. You want to learn each and every step independently of the other first. You want to master the art of full-length sizing and how to properly do it. And what the overall trim length should be and how to trim brass and how to chamfer brass, how to clean brass. 
there's there's all this stuff that's going to go on long before you ever put it in a press to size it, you know? And then what lubes, how to lube it properly, how much is too little, how much is too much, how much damages the cases, what's not clean enough to really start dirtying up your full-length sizing die and putting carbon in there and scratching your brass all up or wearing the, the dies out early. There are all these parts in reloading or steps that you're going to go through. And I think... As a new reloader, you should think long and hard about learning and mastering each step independently first so you know how it works. Hence, this company that had sent the engineer and lead of the sales department over to this company that I guess makes custom firearms, not 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 rifles, but does something in the firearms industry. And they bought a couple of these uh, really high-end automated reloading machines, and they were having all kinds of trouble. And the simple thing was – they just didn't know how to reload. They didn't know what each individual process was supposed to be like, how the dives were supposed to be set, how do you full-length size, how much lube do you put on. And if you've got all of this going on at the same time and you really aren't a master of each individual process, you can see where this is going to become a really big problem in a hurry. So not only are you going to waste a lot of money, excessive amount of money, but you're going to make really crappy ammunition – you're going to put yourself in harm's way. Things are going to go wrong that, that you just don't understand why. And it's going to turn what should be a really pleasant, quiet experience into a train wreck. So when you're reloading, you know, at the end of the time, you know, you're going to have a couple hundred rounds there. And you're going to be like, whew, man, I'm pretty proud of that. That's, that's awesome. And then when you go to the range and you shoot it and it's shooting really well and it's good standard deviations, you're going to be like, yeah, I made that. That's awesome. You don't want to be the guy that goes to the range blowing primers out the back, ammunition that won't seat properly. There's people that probably at some point might not even opt to, to choose to shoot beside you because they feel that you're a danger to them and to others. So learning each step individually is something to take into consideration. What I really like a lot about the reloading industry itself, especially when you start looking at the different presses, is – they actually come with a, a manual, a step-by-step -step reloading manual. And as, as stupid as this sounds, I ask people all the time, you know, when we're talking about reloading, even people that I know, hey, did you ever read that book you got with your Reading Press? And, oh, you know, I sort of skimmed through it, but yeah, I know how to do it. Well, did you read the instruction manual on your die set? Because all of your dies set up quite differently. You know, you've got different expander balls you can use. You've got different bullet seeders. For different types of bullets, whether it's a VLD or soft, you know, soft point, like a round nose. So you've got different stems that you can use. All of this becomes really important. And so I think it's super, super important for the beginner reloader is to be careful on your goal is to make ammunition. But more importantly is to make high quality ammunition and learn the art of reloading. That's sort of what you're after. And as you keep going, you'll keep learning more. You'll get more comfortable with each of the processes, how they go. You're going to make errors. You're going to crush brass. You're going to put too much lube on. You're going to get a case stuck in the press. It happens. You're going to make all these rookie mistakes. But doing it in a single stage setup allows you to fix it, adjust it, and keep moving on and discard what was the problem? So if you have a couple cases that you put too much lube on and you buckled up all the shoulders, well, then you throw those cases away. You clean everything back up. You get everything sat back up the way it's supposed to be, and you and you start sizing again. But if you're doing a full automated system, now you've got loaded ammunition with buckled, and you've got halfway loaded ammunition in the process. Some have powder, some don't. Some have primer, some don't. And now you've got this whole thing to tear down. You've got to check and make sure that pieces didn't get processed through that now have a board and don't have powder. I mean, so you can see we're just doing this in a very controlled step-by-step -step environment can, can reap big benefits both for your learning curve and your safety. So one of the really cool things about reloading is a lot of the companies like, for example, uh, Redding, the Big Boss Kit, that's what I started with. I mean, my dad had an old reloading press, and of course, I started as a young kid. My first round I reloaded for was a 6.5x55 Swede, and I promise you I closed my eyes when I pulled the trigger because I wasn't quite sure if I was going to blow myself up as a teenager. You know, you made your first loaded ammunition and 
people are standing over your shoulder watching. You're like, wow, I'm putting gunpowder in here and I'm putting this in there. And you're like, gosh, you know, I mean, I hope this works. And then you survive that and you continue on reloading, which is pretty cool. I remember the first time I went to the range with my first hand loads. Of course, back then I, I rolled my, my coat up and I shot off my coat. And it was a 50-yard range and I had tacks holding my target up. And I started shooting the tacks off the target and the target would fall down. That was my first exposure to reloading. It was fantastic. And I really was convinced that I could make better ammunition than I could buy as long as I paid attention to the details. Another thing to think about when you're getting these is a lot of these presses now have kits that come with a lot of the tools that you're going to need. So this is a very tool-oriented type job that requires a lot of things you might not think about. So like I said, my first reloading kit was Redding Big Boss, and it had inside there the powder trickler, which is what I wanted. You have, you know, your case trimmer and all the heads because you got to trim your cases and chamfering tools and, and things to clean the necks out. And I think it had a lube pad to, to lube the cases. And, of course, it had the press and a great book. I believe it had for seeding the primers. might have been a hand tool. So it, it gets you started off with a lot of the equipment in a kit together that you're going to have to go out and start buying individually. So it makes that part a lot easier. And the one thing I liked a lot about it was it came with a scale, not a digital scale, a balance beam scale. So you weighed your charge, you threw it, you put it on the scale, and you trickled it up to the appropriate weight. No electronics involved, no electronics floating, no need for calibrations. I mean, all these things that turn into a nightmare. Learn how to throw charges. And you individually dump each one into the case because the Redding Big Boss, I'm, I don't work for Redding, right? I'm just throwing out there that this is what my first real kit was. It has a, a powder funnel. You stick over the case mouth and you dump your powder in and you throw another charge. From a powder thrower and you stick it on the balance beam scale and you scale it up and you honestly I, I think you know they were talking about a digital powder thrower being able to throw the charges every 15 seconds or 20 seconds well I could do that by hand if not a lot faster and way more accurate and and I can visibly see if I'm over or under and I can take a little powder out or I can just totally discard that that charge altogether and start over I think the only thing I had to buy uh, when I started my kit was I bought, I think it was the BR2 or BR3 powder thrower because it didn't come with a powder thrower. And I mounted that to my bench and I would under throw my charges and then I would trickle them up. And that's how I would reload. And I reloaded like that forever. Even when we were reloading for the shooting school, we had tried automated presses. And now keep in mind, it's a long range shooting school, precision. We had tried a lot of different presses uh, that were supposed to speed the process up. And the problems were some of them weren't made quite well enough. Parts were breaking all the time. We weren't gaining any of that quote-unquote time savings. And we were constantly stopping and fixing things. And the biggest downfall for me was the fact that the powder throwers for the types of shooting that we do do not meter well in those types of presses. So we use like Varget. We use... 4350, Hodgkin's H4350, these are stick powders, and they don't meter well in like pistol ball powder would. And so you get these big swings or variants in, in powder drop or charges, and that does not help you. That's not your friend in reloading. You're trying to have low standard deviations, so at long range, your groups stay really tight together. And my biggest pet peeve and why we still don't use those types of presses is I have to single throw the powder charge. The reason I suggest maybe considering getting a really good balance beam scale is because, believe it or not, there are a lot of digital scales out there. And it's it's I call it the gear acquisition syndrome. And you get into that whatever you're into. If you're into music and guitars, you're buying guitars and amps and everything's shiny and new and makes the perfect tone. You know, you're attracted to it like a uh, fish, something shiny, and you go after it, right? Reloaders do the same, shooters do the same all the time, and now the big craze is a lot of your digital dispensers or auto tricklers, and, and the, granted, they are great tools. They're, I have no doubt about it. For $1,000 or in some cases much more than that, great tools. We used four digital powder throwers calibrated to reload for the shooting school, but we hand threw the charges. 
We had another verification to make sure nothing floated. We calibrated them all with the same weights. And then we actually loaded the, the bullets on a single stage press. We hand primed each one. So even at the level of loading thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds a year for the shooting school, it was almost all done on single stage processes because we can control each one. We can watch for errors. If they happen, we catch it immediately. We fix it. We discard that ammunition and we keep moving on. The automated does not give you an opportunity to do that until sometimes it's too late and some of that ammunition is already in your bag. Now, the balance beam scale, some guys might go, why would you use that? Dude? I mean, that's how they weighed stuff in, in BC times, right? But the truth of the matter is one of the best, most accurate powder scales is called a Prometheus Model 2. It's a balance beam scale. It does not require power. I think this one has a light on it, and of course it has an electronic powder throw, but I'm saying about the balance beam scale itself, they don't require power. They are extremely accurate. And more importantly than accurate, they're consistent. So when you set that, like for example, Redding makes a really nice uh, balance beam scale, and I could throw charges probably every 10 to 15 seconds. It wasn't any faster or slower than than these auto automated ones, but you don't have to worry about the weights floating or the machine going out of calibration or lights, quote unquote, affecting how it's operating because you've got incandescent lights or whatever you hear people saying about all this crazy stuff. It's a balance beam scale. And so if you work your load up at, let's just say, 41.0 grains, you can set your balance beam scale for that. And you're going to throw, if you trickle, 41.10 almost every single time. And you can discard anything that's out of your tolerance range. So if you're okay, hey, it can be plus or minus a tenth. I'm good with that. But one of my um, greatest aha moments was, and I loaded this way forever, and we were shooting quite long ranges and in competition, is that was the key to super low standard deviations is um, I went out to Oregon. I was out there with Daryl Holland and the president of Savage Arms was there, uh, Ron Coburn. And so there was a lot of really, you know, big names. And, and to me, people that I looked up to. So these were people that I admired, people that I enjoyed their friendship, people that have helped me over the years, mentored me in, in different ways. And so when I when I looked at them, I looked at them as, as my peers, and I wanted to make them proud. And so when I went out there, we're talking, oh gosh, you know, this had to have been 14, 13 years ago. I was, took a 308 out, I hand-loaded for it, exactly the way that I'm talking about with the balance beam scale. And when it was my turn to have my rifle chronographed in front of 13 peers of mine, my standard deviation was one. And Daryl turned around and said, hey, Oh my God, that's incredible. I've never seen that before. And the other guys were asking, wow, is that, is that factory ammunition or is that hand loads? And I'm like, oh, that's hand loads. So it was, it was one of those really cool things, guys. It was absolute luck that that was the five that was the closest together. Um, but of course, across the five shots that we shot, my standard deviation was one. And just taking that time and effort through each individual single process, you, know, you couldn't have wiped the smile from my face, you know? It was just awesome. And it wasn't that I was bragging or, you know, oh, I'm the better reloader here. That wasn't it at all. It was just that it was a very rewarding moment for me that all that hard work and effort paid off and that it showed and that other people who were peers of mine I, gave me a little respect over it. Like, wow, you're pretty good at reloading. Way to go. You know, how did you do that? And, you know, I, I've never seen that before. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've never seen single digit standard deviation. So, you know, got a little pat on the back and you know, a big smile. That was really awesome. But that's why we do it. And so the, the trick of it was, and it was all done on single processes, one step at a time, completed to the end. And so I would go through and clean the brass. I would lube it properly, I would full length size, I would seat the primers, I would throw the powder chargers, I would seat the bullets, and then I would clean them. And all this was done one step at a time from beginning to end, no breaks in between. And so you want to make sure that that like when you're going through this process that you don't walk away with half ammunition loaded. So you don't want some powder in some cases, some seated bullets, half primed, half not primed. I mean, so my goal was when I when I reloaded was to set the time aside that was necessary. And this was tough because keep in mind, 
you know, we were a growing business. I had a young family. And so for me to squeak down into the little reloading room at that time for two or three hours was really difficult. But I shut the door behind me, no radio, no phone, no cell phone. And that was two hours of just awesome quiet time of just me making ammunition. And I have to say, looking back, I actually really enjoyed doing it because it was quiet. It was peaceful. The only thing I had to focus on for a couple hours was a very simple process, one step at a time, and and end with a finished product. And so I got to focus. I got to think. It was just a really enjoyable process for me. And that's what started me reloading. Now, I will say that now we are looking at some advanced equipment. So reloading, like everything else, is coming along big time. And we'll have some of those people, hopefully as a guest on here, to talk about some of the stuff that's coming out. It's fantastic. But do yourself a favor first before you start jumping at, A, all the super expensive stuff. So it is not required. Trust me, a $99 press and some simple hand tools and some powder throwers and a balance beam scale will make world-class ammunition. But I think maybe it's something to take into consideration is the one benefit to that type of reloading is you get to master each process. And if you make errors, catch them early, correct it, and move on without that error being in loaded ammunition now that you're going to take to the range. Then if you decide to go with you know, advanced powder tricklers. And if they start to float or things start to go wrong, you'll recognize that, hey, that's not supposed to work that way. And why is that like that? Are you looking in the case and you're seeing that it's not the same height? You know, you you know something's wrong. So you'll recognize when things go wrong because you know what it's supposed to be. You, you're looking at the cases and, and you're recognizing there's a problem because you know what they're supposed to look like when they're sized. And so I think that's the benefit of looking at that process and saying, okay, I'm going to master each instrument in the band first before I try to to be the whole band at once. And I think that's what's led us down the, the path that into reloading. And I will say this. This is the honest to God's truth here. I have a progressive press on my bench. I have not, and I've had a couple, most of which were sold. I can't get them run. I couldn't get them to run the way that I want them to to shoot. I couldn't get the consistency that I needed to shoot the way that I want to shoot. I didn't see the time savings that was promised. Great for, you know, spray and pray stuff. If you want to blast through a pistol ammunition, but it's certainly more efficient in pistol ammunition. And, you know, your acceptability for accuracy as far as it's different in rifles and it's different types of powders, which cause different problems. It's bigger cases, which is harder on the machine than pistol cases. So I'm not talking about pistol reloading. I'm not talking about loading 223 for an AR to go out and blast prairie dogs and have some fun. That's that's different. What we're talking about is precision reloading, loading for the best accuracy that you can get, not almost, but the best. And so I've sold every one that I had. I could. I am not sold on them yet. I still have one that's practically brand new sitting on my bench. I haven't reloaded them. I, I tried to go through, and what I was going to do is hand throw the charge and then full length size prime and do everything else on the progressive press. But rather than using the press meter, I was going to hand throw with the digital throwers or the other throwers I had set up. So I had four of them that were running at the same time, all calibrated. And of course, those that know me know I'm a, a little OCD on this stuff anyway. But even at that, it left me open to the potential of having a round get processed through without a powder dump. And so I didn't have enough stations to put powder checks and all the other stuff. And so I just said, you know what? When I'm handing ammunition to a customer, I want to be 100% certain that that is perfect. And anything less than that, I can't do it, won't offer it. And so I haven't reloaded for the customers in about two years because we haven't found a system that's efficient enough that's correct. And so we still don't use the progressive press. Now, I will say, and just to throw this out there, we are looking at some. And I've got – I'm crossing my fingers. And, you know, really high hopes one of our instructors here, his name's Walt – a really great friend of mine, and we've been talking back and forth. I've talked to Mark. Uh, he's one of our instructors here as well. And we're, we're talking about the different presses that are coming online for 2020 and whether or not we want to take a chance on one or just buy one and start loading stuff for ourselves just to see if it really is what it's supposed to be, if there is the quality ammunition there, and if there is the time savings without 
you know, constant breakdowns or constant adjustment issues and things that just screw the whole process up. And so we're working on it. And I don't want to say that I'm never going to go that route. We may. But for new shooters, I think that's really something to think about. So I hope this is a really good introduction to things you should think about before you consider getting into reloading and maybe some of the pros and cons of the different things that you're going to have to make decisions on. So hopefully get you started in the right direction. Next week's podcast is going to be starting to break down the step-by-step process of reloading and, some again, some things to think about. So I'm not going to tell you specifically this is how I do it and how everybody in the world should do it. I'm going to explain to you some of the different processes that people will use and maybe some of the pros and cons that, that we see and, and just give you food for thought and let you make those decisions on your own. Now, up to this point, we have not offered any reloading classes, and uh, although we have talked about it in the past, um, we have decided that there's too much liability or risk for us if somebody were to go and make ammunition and mess something up in the process. And just to put this final thing out there is that you can really get yourself in harm's way. You can get hurt doing this. Uh, We know somebody local that was distracted while reloading and put pistol powder inside a 30 odd 6 case, blew the gun up, and lost an eye over it. So you have to take that risk into account that even experienced loaders, and this guy had 30 years reloading. I don't know him personally. I know of him. I know of the accident, and I feel really bad for him. But you are open to make these mistakes. And so we talk about, you know, no distractions, no phones, no TVs. You know, I mean, that's just me and the level that I want to be at. Because one mistake doing this can seriously cost you or someone there with you. If It it could be your, your son or daughter shooting that rifle or your son and daughter shooting beside you. You know, a 13-year-old kid on the bench beside you that's going to pay the price with you or get hurt because they're shooting your aim. So there's a whole level of danger that's potentially there if you screw this up, and you have to be willing to accept that. And you have to put different protocols into place to mitigate the risk, to make sure that you're doing everything you can that, to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so because of that, we can't teach this class, uh, just simply because if that accident happens, we don't want to be part of that of someone says, well, that's Jamie said to do this and he never mentioned that and we didn't know that this danger existed. And so for for that reason, we have to bow out and we can't teach it. We won't do any video work on it. And and even in here, I'm not really teaching you how to reload. I'm just trying to guide you for some things and resources to get you started. Now, next week's podcast, we are going to get into reloading and going through step-by-step process of things to think about. And... We are going to get into advanced hand loading. That will probably come in the third podcast that we're going to do very shortly. I will recommend that you go to a website called Varmint Owls. He's no affiliation with us. He doesn't uh, sponsor the podcast. But visit Varmint Owls. He's got a great reloading source. And give that a good look over because he's got one of the best websites with reloading that I think I've seen in a long time. And so if you want to get a heads up, or you want to get a foot ahead of what's going on, what we're going to be talking about in next week's podcast, sneak over to his website. It's farmadows.com and look at his reloading page. I think it's just a wealth of information. If you want to get a step ahead of what we're going to be talking about, so maybe you can uh, follow along a little bit better or maybe a little bit more in-depth detail, run over to Varmadows website and check it out and then tune back in for next week as we get into the reloading process. Now, you guys know that as shooters – and you're listening to this podcast, so obviously you shoot, that the trigger is probably one of the most important things on the rifle when it comes to the time to actually fire the rifle. I mean, that's what's holding everything back, and that's the only part that's in motion besides the firing pin that's that's moving while the firing process is happening. And so the triggers, 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 they are super, super, super important to a high-quality rifle or to marksmanship, period. And that's why we use Trigger Tech. And that's why they are sponsors here of the podcast. They became sponsors of us long after we've started using them. So if you want a really good quality trigger and you want to shoot your best, 
I'm just throwing it out there. It's it's the product that we use. It's a product that we believe in. I think Trigger Tech probably makes one of the best world class triggers on the market today. And I'm really excited to say that on July 24th, officially, is the release of the two-stage triggers. Now, those that know me and shoot with me know that I absolutely love two-stage triggers. And so I've been shooting a Trigger Tech single-stage trigger. We have them here at the school for years. And just crossing my fingers, hoping that someday that that would happen. And and a couple years ago, the rumor started that this trigger was coming. And super excited. I, I talked to him on the phone. I'm like, hey, you know, if you happen to have an extra prototype laying around, could you send it out to me? We got one of the prototypes here to test and work with about six months ago, nine months ago. It is awesome. It's everything a trigger should be. And now we have a diamond and a special that is a pre-release that we've been working with. Fantastic. I love two-stage triggers. And we'll talk about triggers in a future podcast. We're going to be talking about custom rifle building and some parts and pieces that we go over. And that's going to include triggers and give you some food for thought. But that said, guys, on July 24th, Trigger Tech is releasing for sale the two-stage trigger. So if you get a chance, head over to TriggerTech.com. Check out your local vendors or dealers Get your orders placed or pre-orders placed now. If you're a two-stage trigger fan, this is going to be the trigger. So we're excited. We've been using it here for a while. I can't say enough good things about it. As soon as the trigger is released July 24th, we will be doing some video reviews on it as well. So thank you, Trigger Tech. But if you want to get your best shot down range, you've got to have a great trigger. And the only trigger that we use here is Trigger Tech. Now, we also have a rifle stock to give away. We're really excited to do this. Again, thank you, MDT, for donating a chassis. And we would like to thank and congratulate Rob Arnick on winning the MDT chassis. So, Rob, I'm going to be reaching out to you on our Facebook page, congratulating you. If you would, please send me your address and contact information, and we will try to get this stock out to you ASAP. MDT is sending me a brand new chassis that we're going to send to you. It is in route. Uh, It's going to be shipped out here in about seven to nine days. And we have a shooting school that is a level one, two, and three class next week. That's Monday through Friday. So there's a small chance that I'll get it out next week. But as soon as she gets here and I can get her shipped out to you, we're going to get that chassis shipped out to you. So congratulations, Rob, and thank you so much for being signed up for our newsletter as well as following us on Facebook and for throwing your name in the hat for winning the chassis. I think you'll really like the chassis, so congratulations. So guys, stay tuned for the next part of our reloading series. Next week, we're going to start talking about and breaking down the individual processes, some of the tools and the processes we go through as we reload So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys. That'll be coming out next week. And then I think the third week we're going to be talking about some advanced hand loading and some food for thought, as well as hopefully some interviews for people that are in the industry. If you shoot long range and you shoot a lot, a lot of us reload simply because we want to make fantastic high quality ammunition and the fact that in the long run it does save us money and allows us to shoot more. So that's why we get into it. If you get a chance, stop over. Our long-range shooting schools are in full swing. We have some new dates announced for July and some dates coming for August and September. Keep in mind, we are a very high-quality shooting school. We only allow four students in a class. I teach every single class, so if you come in, you'll be spending time with me at the range. And so far, this format has worked fantastic. I get to enjoy doing what we do here and sharing our passion with you. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on the podcast. We certainly enjoy it. Please take the time to share it. Leave some comments. It helps other people find us, and that means a lot to us here. My name is Jamie Dotson. I'm your host, and you're listening to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. Uh-huh.